Gersh Bloomberg from Rutgers University. And he's going to tell us about his standalone gnomes or anyone the Xetonic insulator. Okay, thank you for inviting me to this scenic place. Um, so I will. Uh, so this um, this uh, this research was done in collaboration. It's a collaboration with between Rutgers Group and Technion Group, um, and mainly carried on by uh, my student, my year, who is now in Karlsruhe and and a postdoc, Pavel Volkov, who accepted a uh, faculty position in Yukon. Uh, all the results I show today are published in these three papers. So in this uh, quick talk, um, I will not going to give any details. Um, OK, doesn't work. Ah. Still doesn't work. Okay, so I will uh, skip the motivation here because, uh, in some sense, it was given uh, in uh, Nikolai's talk. We learned that all our troubles are coming from Fermi Dirac statistics, and if we deal with bosons, all problems are gone. So, therefore, let's go straight to to bosonic excitations, and in this case, I will talk about um, excitonic excitations. So this subject has a very long history. Um, people try to create excitonic condensate for a long time. The most successful attempts were in devices to, de to couple two de-electron gases, in quantum well structures, but more recently, yeah, of course, the the story goes back about 60 years where Horn, uh, Geldish, uh, Halter and Rice, etc., uh, proposed that there is an instability uh, and metal can turn, metal with electron hole interaction can turn in an insulator. So this was perhaps first time realized in the Surbana uh, paper in Peter Abamante's group where in TISE2, the claim was made that they saw something that looks like charge density wave, but uh, the claim is that it's excitonic insulator. And the reason for that is that they did electron loss spectroscopy yields measurement at finite Q, and they saw softening at plasma mode, uh, also with a, with a softening of the phonon mode. And the argument in this science paper is that in a trivial Peirce transition, you wouldn't expect softening of a plasma, but, but because they observed that, it's an excitonic insulin. So I will go straight to discussion of uh, this system. And it's fairly old compound that, that was known for about 60, 70 years. It was known that there is a structural phase transition just above room temperature. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in Hida Takagi's group, uh, by doing carpus, they noticed that the top band is not parabolic, but has this flat top as function of temperature. And that led Hida collaborator make a claim that this is a good candidate for an excitonic insulator. Yes. I, 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 will, I will get to that, yes. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that, yes. So, okay, so the compound, con it's a quasi 1D compound, contains tantalum and nickel chains. Um, and 
uh, well, this is uh, Hides' work where they show that the, uh, there is a second order phase transition at just above room temperature. And what happens in that structural phase transition, uh, there is an orthorhombic to monoclinic transition, basically 90 degree angle uh, becomes larger than 90 degree angle. And those are the distances between the tantanum. Tantanums are shown here as brows. So this happens at uh, 328 degrees. Now, the order parameter that does that, it's quadrupole order parameter. So it's, it's uh, B2G in D2H group. Uh, so it's, it's a Gerade. So this kind of probe is not accessible by optics. Uh, some other, other, other methods need to be used. Um, uh, he then went further and he realized that doing substitution on selenium site by isovalent sulfur allows to change the condition of this material and this material, the parent material, you need to look for the dotted line. It's a compensated semi-metal. And by doing this substitution due to some chemical pressure, a gap opens up and becomes small gap insulator. So there's a transition from one to another. And then conveniently, if this is an excitonic insulator, then we can probe different regimes, BCS regime all the way to BC regime. Um, okay, so the physics here is trivial. Um, uh, the idea, that very old idea, Pon uh, put it forward, I guess, first that that if you have a semiconductor and there, are, there is excitonic state due to electron hole excitations with some binding energy B, and if this binding energy is larger than the gap, then this system is unstable and uh, there is a normalization of the bands and, and the symmetry is going to be lowered. Uh, now, in a regime of semi-metal, uh, this gap is negative. And this is like in BCS, the, the system is always ready for the instability. Instability here is the hybridization of these bands. In high symmetry phase, this hybridization is forbidden because they belong to different symmetry, symmetry representation. But then when you break the symmetry, it becomes allowed. And then the gap opens up and this transition is basically the coherence fix controlled by coherence factor, essentially. BCS-like type story. And uh, what in that Hida's initial paper was observed is essentially is essentially this band. So this 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 was the idea there. Uh, and well, accompanying with structural change because uh, as soon as we break the symmetry and this symmetry breaks the mirrors. Also, there is a lattice distortions that come with it. And then the question is what drives the transition related to what you're asking me. Uh, so the transition could be driven by electronic part excitons, condensation of excitons. It could be by softening of optical phonon, or it could be a uh, strain field, uh, basically ferroelastic transition. Yes. They belong in high temperature phase, they belong to different representation. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These points, the crossing points are close to high symmetry points in, in practice. Well, let's discuss that. I, don't have time to go into that. Let's let's get the big picture. So the big picture is now how do we how do we uh, find out what drives the transition and uh, the way to do it. So that's the uh, that's the new method. Let's put it is to look for critical dynamics. So you basically measure the response function as function of frequency and see what happens with that response function. 
So what you expect in second order phase transition is a soft mode. And if this mode is of excitonic origin, electronic origin, then it's driven by, by indeed excitons. That would be the hallmark, that would be the uh, method to see that. If, it, if it's softening of the phonons, then it's phonon driven, or it could be also acoustics, basically, basically the strain field. Um, now, the method to look for that, because it's a, it's a, in, in even representation, the excitations is uh, the Raman scattering and in high temperature phase, these two bands, these excitations belong to different representations. And when the symmetry is broken, mirror plates are gone, so they become become in the same representation that's essentially opens up the mixing. Uh, so main points. Um, we can show that we show that there indeed there is a condensation of electronic uh, so, so the susceptibility divergent susceptibility comes from the electronic stuff. And to do that, uh, this is now finally some data, uh, come quite complex plot. Uh, this is energy in semi-log. This is the interband transition appearing here. Uh, the sharp lines of phonons. Uh, this is the electronic continuum that this is temperature on some nonlinear scale, just to emphasize the region around TC linear plot of the same data. And you can basically see how the spectral weight uh, moves to the low energy. And then below the transition gap opens up. So that's the blue sky with sharp, sharp excitation. Yeah. I'll show you, I'll show you everything. Just one sec. So, uh, I'm going to skip the technical plot. I mean, the details are here in paper, but the data looks like these points. And in order to get to that question that Andre correctly asked, is that this need to be decomposed and we decompose it using, using the final model. Leonid spoke about that. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, in, in two parts, so there is this electronic part, which is blue, and then, then there is a phononic part, which are this green sharp peaks. And if we turn on interaction, which we also can determine spectroscopically, then we can compose this, this red line. So that, that repeats the data, right? And this blue, line is the one that you're asking for, and that can be described by OEDAM uh, uh, response function, excitonic response function, it's semi-metal, so it's everything is in, in OEDAM regime. And then if I calculate, if I basically do the pits and find what the frequency of that peak does, then Above the transition, I see that this mode gets goes soft before that gets interacted at the transition. So if I continue this line, I get to some temperature which is higher, uh, lower than the real transition, but I see that transition. Now, phonons don't soften. The phonons actually harden at the transition. So these are phonons. Huh? This mode softens above the transition. This is TC. This mode softens, this goes down. Yeah, okay, but that's, yes. Remember we break uh, discrete symmetry here. But uh, in principle, quasi-Goldstone, yes. The sh 
if there is. But uh, yeah, but this is this is discrete symmetry break. Um, okay, so we can extract so stability, and well, that's the uh, Landau theory here. Uh, and now I plot inverse susceptibility that comes from that same data. So one over chi would diverge, uh, well, chi would diverge at this temperature. And this is Curie Weiss. Andre, you say there's not enough points. Well, that's, that's what we do. It's quite linear here. Uh, and uh, phonon by itself doesn't do that. Uh, that's a susceptibility from the phononic part. That does nothing here. Now, if I turn on the coupling between, between this uh, electronic and phononic response, then analogously to what York did 15 years ago for pleiotides, uh, you can see that you can enhance transition from this point to this point. Your susceptibility will look like this. And if you include also the strain field, then you can basically get the divergence at the right place. Okay, so now um, the point two is that we can actually directly probe this transition and that's directly seen in the spectra. That will be the spectra of different channel. Uh, so we, we essentially see this coherent interbar transition peak and that gives us even even the magnitude of the of the gap, which is well, some large number set in KTC. So, uh, in what channel do you have this? The sensitivity is, of course, in the in the B two G channel. It's the channel where you expect the instability, right? And uh, 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 so yeah, so that's. That's what I just said. And the last point is that if we dope the system and go away and drive the system to um, drive the system to semi-metal, uh, excuse me, from, from semi-metal to, to uh, a semiconductor, I'm going to skip the details here. Then the interesting thing is that we actually start seeing this exciton in the gap as a very sharp peak. So this exciton is in B2G channel. It's a dark exciton, it's a quadrupole exciton, which by itself is interesting. You can't see it in optical conductivity. It doesn't give you light back, but it's a quadrupolic, quadrupolic bound state. Uh, okay, so uh, let me get to the phase diagram. So this is now the doping. Uh, from semi-metal to small gap semiconductor. This would be the, based on the, all the data and analysis, this would be the excitonic transition if, we wouldn't, if it wouldn't couple to lattice, if we don't have lattice. And so we would have the critical point here. Uh, if we add optical phonons, the line shifts up. If we uh, add just a constant strain field, the line goes here. And if we actually use some, uh, as, well, account for the softening of the shear modulus, then we recover the measured points of the phase transition. So, uh, so take away message is that uh, um, the, hidden uh, uh, phase transition, zero temperature phase transition uh, is lifted by interaction with the lattice, but the only channel where susceptibility diverges is the really excitonic channel. So it's, it's quite fair to call it excitonic insulator because no other responses do uh, do diverge in the system. So that's, and that's where the details are. And I'll, I'll be happy to talk further with you, right? Okay. Thank 
Thank you, Gersh. Uh, we have time for uh, one quick question or maybe two. Uh, we already have quite a few questions. Can you start setting up? Uh, no questions? Do we have questions online? Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Yo 